Uh, thank you all for, for coming this morning, uh, such as it is, for sitting down at your computer and joining us. We are thrilled to be able to share Horseshoe Crab information, and I just want to say that um, as the Director of Education and Citizen Science, one of the great pleasures in my life is actually working with the volunteers, including the many volunteers who are involved in the Horseshoe Crab Monitoring Program. And so uh, this talk will be initially sort of about horseshoe crabs and um, what they do and how they work and where they live and that sort of thing. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we're trying to learn about the horseshoe crabs. And frankly, we still have lots of questions. Even as we learn, we learn we have more questions. And we'll talk about how we're studying them. I'll show you some pictures of the volunteers at work and what we've learned so far. Um, so please, especially while this is such a small group, you're welcome to just say, hey, Sarah, I have a question. It's very, very easy to do that here. Um, and I am kind of curious if you feel like writing in the chat or just speaking up, tell us, um, have you seen horseshoe crabs around here? And, um, and what have you seen? Um, Betsy, do you want to just describe a little bit about what you've seen? Because I know, oh, now I made you mute yourself and <laughs> put you on the spot. Um, thanks, Sarah. Yes, I have been seen down on the point on uh, here in Lewis Point. Um, and I don't, under, I don't know who's male and who's female, which has been an interesting question for me because it looks like they're mating. And they're little, I don't know if you can see me, I, I can, they're, they're small ones that are on top of the bigger ones. Like this? Even okay. smaller than that, they look. Yeah. And so I didn't know, are those young ones? Are they just learning how to get around? Um, they come in on the rocks. I wanna say more at high tide. Um, there's a huge, I had no idea till this summer how high the tide changes. It's just fascinating. Um, so they come in into, onto just on the edge of the water and the land. And there've been lots and lots and lots of them coming in. So, um, and then they disappear and um, they're just fascinating to me and I really know after all this time, I, I used to go when the kids were little, the grandchildren were little, we'd go down to the boat landing um, next to schooner landing there. And there'd be, you know, hundreds of them at certain times of the year coming in there. And that was our entertainment for the day. Um, and now it's my entertainment to walk out there and I'm just sitting on the rocks as much as I can and, um, and just watch them. So I'm very excited about learning more about it. Great, I appreciate that, Betsy. So who else would like to share? Anybody else want to just make a comment about what they've seen or anything like that? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm down on Houston Cove. Um, and uh, we, we've always gotten a lot of horseshoe crabs here in, the, uh, in this time frame, and mostly uh, early to mid June, um, and we get down to flats here in the area, so they have to move pretty quickly to keep up with the tide to get in as far as we are uh, in the uh, as the tide comes in and goes out. They seem to, um, like Betsy said, they seem to spend a lot of time right up uh, near the rocks. They they don't seem to like to come out of the water at least. My observation has been they like to stay right on the edge of the water and the land where the rocks are. Uh, last week, I kayaked up to the middens uh, north of the bridge and stopped over there, uh, pulled over by the middens, and there were a lot of horseshoe crabs up there. And they were very, what was interesting about them, they had very clean shells. A lot of the a lot of the uh, horseshoe crabs I see down here have a lot of barnacles and other growth on their shells, but it kind of struck me that the shells um, further up the river seem to be a lot cleaner. So they're just fascinating animals to me. I just 
I just love to watch them and, and I'm looking forward to learning more uh, about them today. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. Anybody else like to just share comments or observations before we get started? Okay, great. Well, um, yeah, these are all very helpful, you know, to know kind of what people are seeing is, is interesting because it's hard to keep track of the whole, the whole river. And, um, there certainly seem to be some interesting things related to different parts of the river, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But for starters, I guess we have to go back 467.3 million years um, and look at a little bit about where did these amazing creatures come from. And this um, middle image is a Eurypterid. Um, there were several species, I, I just don't know how many, and um, these were several meters long. And these are the ancient ancestors to today's uh, horseshoe crabs. Uh, they would, um, we believe, swim through the oceans, kind of undulating with their, with their motion to swim around, maybe using their gills like today's do to swim. The top left-hand image is one of the fossilized, um, this is a fossilized image of a Eurypterid. And the bottom image on the right is kind of what the ocean looked like. Some of the other um, creatures of that time period were the nautilus and the jawless fish and um, some of the other creatures that are kind of um, floating around in there. So, you know, very different ocean than what we know today. And they were clearly well adapted to that ocean and amazingly uh, still adapted to this ocean, apparently, uh, as, they, as, they seem to, as they seem to persist. So it's really quite remarkable, I think. The more modern um, horseshoe crab is, is uh, more like 250 million years old. So can everyone um, hear and see everything that they need to see so far? You can see my cursor, hopefully. Excellent, thank you, Bill. And hi. <laughs> um, so just kind of where do they fit in the, in the whole categorization of, of creatures? Uh, scientists have looked at the book gills shown on the lower right of, of these creatures and noticed that they're very similar in structure to that of other um, arachnids. And so these creatures are not technically crabs. We call them crabs, but, and I'll call them crabs, but they, they are actually more closely related to a uh, spider or scorpion. And um, one of the primary ways that, that scientists categorize these is, of course, looking at the morphology and, and in this case, looking at how um, blood flows through, through their lungs, um, or rather through their gills, and how it's extracting the oxygen as they swim around. So those, those flappy gill things, which they actually use to, to swim, are also, oh, sorry, my computer does that sometimes. Um, they are also used for swimming as well as for breathing. So if we just kind of go through the basic parts here, that might be helpful. Um, you know, looking at the, at the view, as if you're looking down, you've got two compound eyes. And these eyes, um, compound eyes being like an insect's eyes where there's many lenses and the organism's brain has to assimilate those um, and uh, be able to, to Put that image together. Those compound eyes are actually underneath the exoskeleton. So when what it's looking through, if you look carefully, if you peel back the, the covering of the eye on the exoskeleton, it's sort of like looking through a screen. Um, so there's like a screen over the eye, and then the eye itself is is um, uh, a compound eye. And then there are some simple eyes uh, in the front, and actually there are some photoreceptors all the way down the dorsal um, aspect of the organism. So they've got these, um, these simple eyes, which are, are detecting shapes and movement. And then they've got these photoreceptors down um, their dorsal area here. Um, and those are just detecting light and dark. And so you can imagine being in the water and it's kind of murky, it'd be particularly helpful if you're trying to escape from a predator to maybe head into the murkier area, or if you're looking to get on land to find a mate, you might need to be able to know where the, 
where the light areas are um, and, uh, and heterosplay. And actually, uh, although we'll talk about this more in relationship to these organisms here, uh, in many places their, their spawning is triggered by uh, the lunar cycle in part. And so the lunar cycle, of course, is a time when you're going to have more light. So being able to sense that light is important to them. Um, they have a this exoskeleton, which uh, so I'm so sorry, my computer is still doing this to me, where it um, jumps around, and I apologize, and I I didn't even move my cursor, I promise. <laughs> um, at any rate, um, so you've got these uh, these um, a, the variety of different legs, and the legs you've got the first walking leg, and then you've got some more walking legs, and then they've got with a pusher leg, and the pusher leg actually has, if you look at one carefully. Um, it's almost like um, a, a series of little shovels attached. And so when it's either digging or pushing itself off, it can really, it can get a lot of, you know, um, a lot beneath its foot there, beneath its pusher leg and be able to push off. Um, the mouth is located right in the central part of the organism. They are really, um, they are eating soft, tissue things for the most part. They're eating worms, marine worms, like blood worms and clam worms that we're familiar with, the ribbon worms. Um, <clears throat> and then they're also eating little um, mollusks, like little clams and so forth that they can crunch up and then and then grab the little bits um, with their first walking leg is, is um, and uh, yeah, the first walking leg is used often to pull food apart and, and stuff it in their mouth. Um, let's see. So, um, and then if you, if you want a sort of a sense of kind of what the, what the very simple digestive system, uh, where it's pretty much a straight line and it's got a mid gut and then the digestive tract down here, um, and excretes waste right down, um, at the base of the, this is called a telson, the, the tail like thing here is, is the official name of the telson. Um, so here's just another view of some of this where you're looking at the book gills and the different leg structures. So you can see kind of the pusher leg here, um, which has a more scientific name, but I cannot remember it right now. Um, and then here's the little feeder arms where it can take its food and put it into its mouth, the pedipalps. Um, and the way you tell a male from a female is that if you look at the first appendage here, uh, if it's got kind of a pincher like this one, it's a female. Um, and this is only possible to tell the difference once they're, uh, they've are they reached sexual maturity. But at any rate, once they're mature, you can tell that because they've got this little pincher on the first appendage. And then this one over here is the appendage for the male. Um, the first appendage, it looks like a little boxing glove on the end, and that's for grabbing the exoskeleton of the females when they're kind of hanging on. Um, and so this is the male, and this is the female here. This organism is a little different. Um, we are talking about kind of how they're categorized, and we all know insects have three body parts. They have a head, a thorax, an abdomen. This organism, much like a spider, has what's called a cephalothorax, which is this whole big unit. It's one big unit. And then um, this part here is the abdomen, but the abdomen is, you know, is connected here. Um, and then it's got this telson. So it's the cephalothorax and the abdomen and then the telson. So um, just to point out, there are several different species of horseshoe crabs, and we only see um, Limnius polyphemus here, but there are a number of others kind of in the um, Chinese seas and um, down <coughs> um, along here and, and throughout the islands and so forth. These are different species that are listed here. Um, and I think sometimes people are surprised to know that our horseshoe crab um, you know, goes all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico. So this is what we call the Atlantic horseshoe crab or Limnus polyphemus. And here's a little bit more about the, the range and where people are seeing them. Um, so generally speaking, I think when people find them, they often find them like this 
uh, when they're out walking along the shore and they've actually shed their exoskeleton. So when you do find a shed exoskeleton, it's going to be kind of sandy colored and dried up like this. Um, it won't be smelly because it is just a shed exoskeleton and I'll, I'll kind of talk about how they shed their skeletons. But when they're young, they will shed them up to 16 times a year or so. Uh, and then they slow down dramatically once they've uh, reached sexual maturity. They're really not growing as much. Um, I actually have a, some questions after some scientists I know about this because there seems to be in the literature a little bit of confusion about um, how much and when the shedding happens once they are mature. Um, but they can get quite large uh, and so, uh, and, they, and their shells don't grow with them. So they presumably do shed, but it's, it's much less often when they're older. Uh, they're just not growing as fast. Now, when you find a dark colored one like this here, um, they tend to be a bit smelly because this is one that's died. Maybe the innards are eaten out, the uh, preyed upon by a gray blue heron or something when it came in to spawn. And the, and the leftovers are left on the shore here. So that's how you tell a, a, a shed exoskeleton from, from the darker um, deceased one. And of course, if you're lucky enough to find them um, spawning along the shore, this is kind of what it looks like. And uh, I think it was Betsy was talking about, you know, oh, we see, see these smaller ones and we see some bigger ones and um, the bigger ones are the females. It takes more uh, biomass to produce eggs than it does to produce sperm. And so for most organisms in the world, including um, many birds and arthropods and everything else, um, mammals are the exception, but for m pretty much everything else, it's generally the females who are larger and the males who are smaller. And so you might come across um, a pair like this and he's holding on to her in the hopes that when he excretes her eggs, um, he can fertilize them. And of course, um, sometimes you get somebody like this, you know, trying to get in on the action. And so oftentimes you'll find three, five, seven horseshoe crabs kind of hanging on. We'll talk more about the spawning in a few minutes, but. Um, Sometimes you find huge numbers of them at this time of year. So kind of the spawning seems to start um, around the end of May is the actual start of it is very variable. It seems around here depend on temperature. Once the water temperature in the shallow areas gets around 20 degrees Celsius, um, they get very busy along the shore and that's probably when you've noticed them um, the most. And when you do see them, uh, somebody else was mentioning about how, you know, some places they've been clean and, and other places not so much, but symbiosis, um, that is or organisms who are using them to um, enhance their own lives without damaging the horseshoe crabs. In fact, in some ways it's helping the horseshoe crabs because it helps them to, to be able to, um, to be well camouflaged if they've got limpets and bryzoans and worms even, as well as many seaweeds will attach themselves. And so um, they can be their own little mini walking ecosystem. And it is fun to see. I like to see what, what kind of has grabbed hold and taken, taken advantage of this. And I mean, it makes perfect sense. They're moving around, um, you know, so if, if, it's, if those organisms are lucky, they get different food sources as they travel. Um, and they just become become little hitchhikers. And then of course there are predators and um, these organisms, the, the birds down here are not what we don't seem to have. Um, by the time the horseshoe crabs lay their eggs here, which is um, mostly the end of May and into, into early mid-June, um, the big migrations of birds up to the Arctic has really already happened. So um, there is not that tight relationship for the most part with migrating flocks of birds and horseshoe crab eggs, the horseshoe crabs, as there is down in the Chesapeake, for example, on Jersey Shore, where they do seem to get the red knots come through just as the horseshoe crabs are spawning. And so there's a very tight relationship. Now here we do have predators, certainly. Um, I've seen black ducks in the marshes taking their little bills and sticking them in the mud after the horseshoe crab eggs, but um, it's just not quite the same type relationship. 
Um, and then of course sea turtles and sea turtles will eat the adults. Um, we don't have many in shore here, but there are occasionally um, sea turtles. I actually have a good friend who saw a sea turtle um, a few years ago and now off of Hog Island um, in, in the in Gunga Bay. So we do have them. They're just not, not as common. And certainly we don't see them very often. Um, so a little bit about the history of, of harvesting. Um, and then we'll get back to a little bit more about the, the biology of them. But people often wonder, well, you know, there, there used to be a lot of horseshoe crabs here. I mean, a lot. And it's true. Um, these images are not from right around here, but this is just to give you an idea. Um, horseshoe crabs were harvested for fertilizer, um, both all along the Atlantic coast and here. And here they were also harvested. And I, I know people who uh, saw them getting shoveled by the shovel hole into pickup trucks and used for lobster bait. And then of course in the Southern states, um, although they do release them after they've been bled, they are used still for, um, for um, uh, pharmaceutical use where they're extracting the blood and using it um, because of the way it doesn't grow the same bacteria that um, the hemoglobin-based blood does, and so it's used. And now, interestingly, um, well, for one thing, they, they have found that they used to say very few of the horseshoe crabs were bled, died as a result of being impacted by that process. And now they say, actually, that probably a fair number of horseshoe crabs, maybe upward of 30%, do die as a result <coughs> of, this, of this type of um, treatment. But the good news is that there is now a synthetic version, and I don't know if it's being produced um, it widely or not, but it is a fairly new, a new thing. Um, but that's that's good news for the horseshoe crabs, I believe. So, um, oops, my, sorry. Like I said, my computer is still jumping around. But anyway, here here's um, a, a little hard to see, but this is the um, dermoscata and um, here is Great Salt Bay, and uh, <clears throat> um, one of the one of the things that we do is we monitor the horseshoe crabs in just a couple places, and so I'll show you better maps in a few minutes. But um, one of the, our monitoring sites is up here um, near the sanitary district in the Dermascotta, um, in sorry, in Great Salt Bay, and another is um, over by the hospital. Um, where's the hospital here? It's a little hard to see, but you know, somewhere down in here, um, in, in Days Cove. So, um, currently we're only monitoring those two sites and I'll talk about why that is in a moment. Um, so here's, here's the overhead site, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, what happened was in Maine, um, the horseshoe crabs, oh, I'm sorry, the horseshoe crabs were, um, uh, being harvested very heavily. And so as a result, um, I believe it was in about 2004 or three, I'm not certain, um, the Department of Marine Resources actually put a moratorium on their harvest. And so um, currently there's no harvesting of horseshoe crabs. And uh, as a result of that, that um, time period, and people noticing that there were fewer and fewer, what was then the Dermascotta River Association initiated this monitoring program. Uh, and it was done in collaboration with the Department of Marine Resources, and we still share their, that our, our data with them. Uh, and it, simultaneously, there was also some monitoring by citizen groups, both in the Brunswick area and in Totten Bay, which is about as far east as they go, um, is in Totten Bay. And so we established um, several sites, uh, the computer, um, and one of those sites is here. This is the hospital. And it's just going out from the corner here. And so we have kind of a transect line that goes along the shore. And what we do is we divide each um, of those areas of that. We just divide that, that transect line into about 30 foot sections, which we call zones. And the volunteers um, are counting horseshoe crabs just along this area. And then our other site is here. This is um, Depot Street, and then this is where the sanitary district is here um, as a piece of property. Oops, again, my fault. Um, and so the volunteers come out to the shore by this rock, and they walk um, the length here. 
and this again is divided into about 30 foot sections and so they have zones and they count the horseshoe crabs um, along along that area um, and they do this monitoring every day from the end of may um, approximately when we start seeing a few of them uh, until uh, the middle of june roughly when we see, seem to see that their spawning has decreased to usually in activity by the middle of june so we've just actually finished up for the season this year in terms of counting. There will still be a few spawning and you might see them laying eggs. What happens is um, the females will dig a little nest in the muddy area and she'll lay um, anywhere between 20 and 80,000 eggs. The eggs are maybe roughly the size of a, a pinhead and sort of translucent um, and she'll bury those in the mud. And after about two weeks, they hatch. And the reason I know this is I did once uh, find some horseshoe crab eggs that had been partially uncovered and spewed all over the mud in a very dry area of the marsh. And I took those um, eggs that I found, I put them into an aquarium and, uh, and, in, and I changed the water periodically and those eggs did hatch, but I didn't realize they had hatched. What happened was I looked at my aquarium one day and all along the surface of the water were these little tiny translucent egg shells, just the open shells. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've killed 200 baby horseshoe crabs and um, this is terrible. What I, <laughs> now I'm really guilty. Um, but when I looked closely in the water were uh, pinhead size translucent uh, without a telson, lacking a telson, and swimming upside down with their gills, little tiny baby horseshoe crabs. And there were probably 200 of them in my tank. Um, and so they were all swimming around and I thought, well, that's great. I'll change the water out periodically. And I did that. And two weeks later, I noticed a whole bunch of little translucent floaty things on top of the tank and I thought, oh gosh, you know, I've killed all these tiny baby horseshoe crabs that I've been carefully tending for the past couple of weeks. And then I looked closely and what those were were the shed exoskeletons of those teeny tiny um, horseshoe crabs. And the exoskeletons were now floating on the surface of the tank and all the little, only slightly bigger horseshoe crabs were now swimming in the tank. Um, they still lacked the telson and they were still uh, translucent, but they were noticeably bigger. Um, and so I kept them for another two weeks and let them shed again. And then I released them because I was afraid I was going to kill them all at some point. So anyway, um, it is pretty interesting. And they, at least for the first couple of weeks, they did seem to shed their skeletons, very, their exoskeletons very, very quickly. Um, so back to what our volunteers do. Um, they go out along these shorelines and um, they first walk the transect line. Actually, one of our volunteers, at least one of them is here. Hi, Anne. Um, <laughs> and so she can fill in the details, but uh, they walk, whoops. Um, they walk the, the transect line in, with a partner and the partner writes down um, and keeps track of how many horseshoe crabs they're reporting seeing. And they they count the ones they can see within a meter um, of the high tide line. And th this is done at high tide. And then they try to look um, beyond the meter from the edge of the water. But um, it is very murky, especially in, in the mill site. It gets very hard to see. And sometimes it depends on the angle of the sun. So this, it can be a little tricky to you just, you can only count what you can see. Um, so they walk the length of the transect line, counting horseshoe crabs in each zone. And then they walk back the other direction. And as they walk back, um, they pick one um, non-spawning horseshoe crab and they measure it as these two volunteers here are measuring horseshoe crab. And then, um, so they just measure across the widest part of the exoskeleton. And they also sex them so that we know what we're seeing a little bit in terms of the, of the different sexes and what their activities are. Um, and that pole that is being held there is, is actually um, partly to make sure you don't fall in the water as you're walking through in your in your waders and um, partly it's also got a, a meter marked on it so we know what's a meter from the high tide line at any time. 
Oh, and incidentally, we do have a permit from the Department of Marine Resources to do this because since it is a species that we cannot harvest, you also can't have it in your possession uh, legally. So we have to get you to be able to, to do this. Um, and so, you know, I just want to talk a little bit um, briefly about what the data shows in terms of what mm -hmm. the volunteers have seen over time. So they started monitoring in, in 2000. Um, uh, sorry, 2002, and um, this, some of this, this graphing data was um, put together by, we had a um, partnership with, with um, the Darling Marine Center, and Dr. Rick Wally, one of his students at the time, Andrew Goody, who has since gone on to get his PhD in lobster-related work, um, but Andrew did many of these data, um, or these graphs that I'm going to show you, and this is just to show that yes, across the board, the females are considerably bigger. Um, and to give you a little bit of sense of what the average width might be of those horseshoe crabs um, over time. I do think uh, we haven't finished looking at data since 2014 in terms of you know, what the carapace width looks like. I um, can say anecdotally, I have seen some very large females in the past couple of years, and I believe they're larger than what has been seen, uh, what I've seen in recent past. And so, um, of course, it makes sense. They can live 30 or 40 years. And so it would make sense, of course, that as the harvesting has been um, ceased, that you, we would start to see some of these uh, horseshoe crabs age. And the good thing is the, the older they are and the bigger they are, uh, the more fecund they are. And so they're going to be producing more eggs um, as they get larger, which is which is probably a good thing. Um, so stop me if you have any questions. It's great. Oh, Anne, yes. Okay, I have a question. Um, many of the females that we saw with a, a male attached to the back of the shell looked very, very large, much larger than the males. And the males were typically between five and six inches uh, across. Yep. Um, when uh, Amy did the last sighting, uh, I think it was last weekend, she found two females, but they were only, I think, five or six inches. Um, would they be young females who maybe aren't of the age to produce? Yep, although, um, yes. And in fact, they, so a couple of things. One is they either are small females that are just sort of entering the, the point at which they can produce, which is probably the case. If they're coming into shore, um, they probably are able to lay eggs and they probably are looking for a mate. And um, the reason I say that is that uh, before they are able to reproduce, they, um, you can't, there's no sexual dimorphism. You can't tell the males from the females. They all look like females. They all have the pincher legs. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they tend not to come in. As far as we know, the young ones generally don't come in at this time of year unless they have to, because of course coming towards the shore means that they're a little bit more susceptible to some of these shoreline predators and um, some of the birds and, and raccoons and minks and things like that. So, um, if they don't have to come towards shore, they tend not to, as far as we can tell. So that leads me to believe that those are young females. They're just small. They're, they're nowhere near, you know, those females, I mean, I'm guessing, but they might be, you know, 10 years old as opposed to the 20 year olds that you're seeing more often in terms of just based on size. And then some of those really big ones might be 30 years old. So. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they can live up to, I believe, 40, about 40 years old. So I don't know um, if, if that's been studied in our area. Um, it is a possible that we do have, a, I'll talk about this more in a minute, but we may have somewhat of a distinct population separate from other populations of horseshoe crabs here because this is um, a relic population of horseshoe crabs, most likely. Um, I'll talk about that again in, in a second here. But um, does that answer your question, Ian? Yes, thanks, good. Sarah, I was yeah. wondering, do our horseshoe crabs migrate at all? Yeah, so um, we, 
we had done very limited study of this um, before I was actually even here um, working in this capacity. Uh, there were some studies that were run with um, with Sue Schaller and the Department of Human Resources and they um, and, and and the DRA and they tagged a few horseshoe crabs, um, which they put little radio tags on them and they had little trackers and they tried to figure out where they went through the winter time. And they lost most of the tags off the horseshoe crab, so it was it was somewhat less successful than they hoped. But the ones that stayed on, um, the horseshoe crabs seemed to just go out into the deeper part of the bay through the winter time and then come into the shore. Um, so they didn't; these ones weren't even going like out to Booth Bay, for example. You know, they were staying they were staying very close um, into it, just in the deeper parts of Great Salt Bay. So. Uh, yeah, good point, Anna. So another thing that the data has um, kind of pointed to here with respect to our horseshoe crabs is here we have um, a couple of graphs. These again were done by Andrew. And um, you've got the percentage of the lunar phase um, going up to 100% lunar um, phase there. And then um, you've so that would be, you know, the brightest moon. <laughs> um, and then you've got the, the number of the observed on the left. I'm looking at the top, the top graph in particular right now on, on the left. And then um, across the, the horizontal axis, you've got the date. And this is just a small sampling of data, obviously, to just sort of make the point. But what Andrew found sort of across the board was that um, the, both the males and the females seem not to be triggered um, to go into these spawning areas, because that's, of course, the only place we really can observe them in the study, by the lunar phase. And so presumably there's something else that is triggering them to go in. Um, and it turns out, if you look at the, the lower um, graph, again, this is sort of a, just a small segment of the, of the data, a quite, quite a small portion, but uh, the number of observed actually um, goes up with temperature and they seem to be most actively spawning at around 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and so it's more here anyway, in Maine, in this part of Maine, our population of horseshoe crabs tends to be triggered by temperature, which makes sense because we're, you know, the northern, easternmost kind of area uh, for this population. And so um, it's not entirely surprising, but it is interesting because that is quite different from populations of horseshoe crabs in other places, and and specifically related to the public data um, about their activities. So, of course, what everybody wants to know. So, you know, how are they doing? <laughs> You've been out there for 15 years counting horseshoe crabs. Uh, what did that show? And at first, uh, you know, the moratorium went into place um, somewhere around. Uh, I, I think it's 2003, 2004. Um, and of course, at first, you know, the data kind of seemed to go up and down a little bit in terms of what was being seen at the mills and in Days Cove by the hospital. And then it seemed to sort of be declining. Um, and we thought, oh, what, you know, maybe there's something else going on besides just the harvesting. Because of course, we know that so many other conditions are changing in the, in the waters, um, you know, in terms of temperature of the water in the Gulf of Maine and um, you know, maybe there's certainly some coastal acidification maybe happening in some areas. We really didn't know. Of course, it is a little hard to, to look at one year's of worth of data even, um, as many data points as that is, and say, well, the population is declining or the population is going up, because we do notice variability from year to year. A couple of years ago, um, we really had very low numbers, and I think a lot of it was due to just low temperatures in the spring when they normally would have been there. And also, they seem to be quite reactive to, um, to fresh water. They, they seem to like a little bit more saline water, and so if you get some big rainstorms, which of course we do in the spring, uh, they tend to not come in. Um, and of course, our volunteers are all, only monitoring the daytime, and we don't yet know what's going on at night. Oops, that was my mistake. Um, but um, it does seem that um, uh, it would be interesting to know, you know, what happens at night when we're not out there watching. But the better news is that in the past few years, um, 
2017 forward that the populations uh, were, uh, 2018 was that year I was specifically saying, I think the weather was really a challenge. We weren't seeing them or they weren't there. I don't know what it was. Um, but now we've got two years where things could seem to be dramatically increasing and in terms of population um, at these two sites. So that's very hopeful um, and I'm super excited to see that and hopefully the, the populations continue. And it's wonderful that our volunteers have been so dedicated to this program because we wouldn't know, you know, if we just stopped doing this, we wouldn't know. We would have no, the state isn't monitoring, we're the only ones monitoring these horseshoe crabs and we would have no idea. So that's a really um, incredible um, part of the story. And the other part is um, that we have other, this other data that I talked about that we have not had a chance to, to go through, but, but it will tell more um, about what's going on with the population once we've had a chance to analyze um, information about the size and so forth. And the other thing is, it's kind of interesting is last year, and I think this summer also, we're starting to flesh out um, a, a project to analyze exoskeletons from the juveniles so that we would have in the future, hopefully more information about the different age classes and what's going on with the younger horseshoe crabs. Because right now, all we know is something about the spawning adult horseshoe crabs. But there's a lot of segments of the population that we don't know much about yet. So, you know, how is how are the lower age classes doing um for example are there as many babies as we would expect and at what ages do they get predated upon um you know is is are there certain ages that are particularly um susceptible to certain types of either pollution or predation we'd like to know that kind of thing um and right now we don't yet so uh, Tara, quick question um what exactly is the average abundance? Is that like the number counted per day or something or? Yeah, good question. So the average abundance in for each year, what I did was we're just taking the numbers of horseshoe crabs, the raw number of horseshoe crabs and divided by the number of times that they were monitored at that particular site. So add them all together and divide by the number of times is the average there. Yes, um, yeah. Anne. Okay. <laughs> it's an um, owner on your thing. What? It says owner on your screen. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I need to change that. I'm not yet. No, it's fine. As one who did the counting, this was the, the first year that I did it. I am not a scientist, so I don't really like averages. As an experience, I can tell you that the water was very cold in the beginning, <laughs> very wet as it poured into my boots and very few horseshoe crabs. When it got to be what Amy and I called swimming weather, you know, it was wonderful. I mean, there were so many more horseshoe crabs you could really see. And we had someone on the shore and someone in the water, and then we'd switch the next time we'd do it the other way. And, and it was like, hold on, don't, don't count so fast. I can't write that fast, you know? And that was really, really exciting. So seeing the averages, our big day was 400. So seeing an average of 60 is sort of depressing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> After, you know, that great day that we had, you'd think the averages would be much higher, you know? But yeah. It yeah. Was really, really fascinating to see the difference over time. Yeah, Anne, Anne was actually at Days Cove. That was her site this year. So that's what she says, 60. That's what she was just re re referring to. Right. Um, and and um, it is interesting. There's quite a difference between Days uh, Cove and the mills in terms of the, of the population. Um, another question that we have come up with as a result of me sending um, a wonderful high school student named Zach Bay out. Um, Zach's been in our camp programs for years and he's been a camp staff person and he needed to do an independent project at Lincoln Academy last year and so he started this exoskeleton monitoring work for us. And one of the things he did, I sent him out, I said, Zach, go look and see where there's horseshoe crab exoskeletons because I would like to know where we need to be monitoring to set up those sites. And so first he went out to the sites I knew about, which were um, in Great Salt Bay, because that's really where I spend most of my time. 
And he said, yep, there's lots of horseshoe crab exoskeletons. This was last summer, during the summer. There's tons of them. There's, you know, all through the summer, little tiny ones, kind of medium-sized ones, bigger ones, dead ones, live ones. And then I said, well, go look in the other places and along the estuary, because I want to know where the baby horseshoe crabs are uh, active. And, 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 this, and so he went, and I know he went to Dodge Point, and I know he went to some couple places in South Bristol, and I know he went to a few other locations, um, some of our properties and some of the, some private properties. And he did not find a single living, well, a single, I don't think about a single exoskeleton shed or a single live juvenile horseshoe crab at all, um, except in Great Salt Bay. And so now, um, which I had did not expect, I didn't know that what might be the case. And so I really don't know if that is um, real <laughs> or not. Um, I mean, I mean, I know that's his data, but I don't know if that's what we're going to continue to see. So I do wonder, um, Great Salt Bay may be the most important nursery grounds for the young horseshoe crabs here. Um, as far as we know, that is the case. And it just elevates the importance of the protection of that area, uh, in my mind. And, um, and it's kind of a curiosity to me about why wouldn't other places also be good nursery grounds uh, in, in along the estuary. And I don't know the answer to that at all at this point. So um, it's kind of interesting. Is he going to do a project this year? Zach is not, but I think that um, it's possible. It's not a definite yet, but Scott Peterson may. And Scott is another young man who's been um, through our camp programs for many years and has um, been a, uh, a counselor in training and is now at Lincoln Academy. And so, so hopefully he'll continue some of this work and. And then, you know, we can develop a, a protocol and, and we can loose Anne out there to go and count horseshoe crab exoskeletons, which is a perfectly fine pandemic activity. Um, you don't have to be in the deep water either. <laughs> <laughs> so. Sarah, what's the, uh, what are the uses of the tail on the crab? Um, is it strictly for defense or does it help it uh, navigate through the water? What are the functions? Oh, good question. So um, basically, it, it may be somewhat for defense in the sense that it kind of looks sharp and dangerous and stops some of the larger animals from being able to prey upon it so easily. But they're so slow moving and it's not actually, you know, it doesn't sting, it doesn't cut, it's not serrated, it doesn't. They, uh, it's not much of a defensive mechanism. It's primarily so that when they get um, either stranded by the, uh, by the tides or, um, or tossed up by waves in, in more high, high action areas, um, high energy areas, they can turn themselves back over um, and right themselves with that Telson. Okay. Yes, when I was young, uh, we used to go along the beach in Rhode Island and and the boys in front of us would take their time turning the horseshoe crabs over and the girls would follow and immediately turn them <laughs> right back. <laughs> you know? But I did notice um, we had one horseshoe crab, we called him Broken Tail. And I was surprised, you know, we were surprised that we saw him three or four times over the six weeks, you know, huh. he was able to survive. He had part of a tail, maybe three fourths, but not the, the total length. Uh, the other thing that we were watching carefully because we were so fascinated by this process, especially when we first uh, saw a couple, if the male was just sort of going along for a ride, you know, hey, this is, this is a cool jaunt, or if he actually did anything. And we really eventually could see when she started to dig into the sand, we could see his, his flippers every once in a while going. And we could also see his tail going. So he would help maneuver. And even if it, they were stuck like between a rock and a hard place, uh, they would, the males would seem to help with their tail maneuver the couple around. 
-hmm. So it must be a very uh -huh. worthwhile stick to have. <laughs> That's great. Great observation. Um, this final graph was just to make the point. Um, this, I'm sorry, it's, it's quite small, I realize. Um, but the, the greenish, uh, I'm sorry, the bluish um, columns are the temperatures in the estuary um, from 1968 to 1972. And the greenish bars are 2013 to 2017. This is also from um, our estuary monitoring data uh, from our volunteer projects. And um, there's not a, there's not a clear big trend um, in terms of temperature, but um, there, there is overall, certainly in the Gulf of Maine, uh, quite a, a significant warming trend that's going on. And so this is just to make the point that the, we don't know what else may be affecting horseshoe crab um, populations, but there are, you know, besides harvesting, for example, um, but there, but there are other conditions out there that we're making a point to try to keep track of through our volunteer monitoring projects, and um, they will certainly that water quality data will certainly help tell the story, help us understand more about the horseshoe crabs and and what the, <clears throat> excuse me what the conditions are that they're living in. So um, that's all I had. I am thrilled to be able to to um, answer any other questions that are outstanding. And um, this is a, a final picture of uh, horseshoe. These, these are two of our volunteers this year actually um, yeah, at the mills and just a, a little picture of some of the activity that they got to witness, which was pretty exciting. Yes, Anne. Um, I had a question. When the female finds uh, the correct spot to make her nest does she lay eggs once or will she go out and come back and find another spot and lay eggs again is it you know that, that's the latter the latter don't put all your eggs in one basket seems okay. to be the, the uh the the theory of the horseshoe crab so i don't know how many times she will do that um you know i don't know if if it's I don't know what triggers them to maybe do a lot of egg dumping. Like maybe sometimes they lay a hundred thousand and then they don't come back in. Um, and maybe other ones lay 30,000 each time. I don't know. Um, we also noticed um, <laughs> there were certain zones that were much more popular. Yeah. I don't know if it's because it was a sandy bottom or if it was, um, you know, the proportion of uh, rocks to sand was better. Yeah. But it almost seemed like a couple would find a spot and then some other couples would come too. Right. I don't know if it was, they were following the other couples or were they just that, that um, bottom of the, the edge of the river was uh, easier for them or more appropriate for laying the eggs. Yeah. Um, I don't fully know the answer to that. It's a great question. I don't know. It, it also is a difference in this population. In, in New Jersey, for example, they're on sandy beaches. Um, and, and we don't see them on sand. We do have a few sandy beaches around, not that many, but a few, and they're not there. Um, and so these horseshoe crabs have certainly adapted. They tend to like the areas, um, as far as I can tell, they actually like the muddy, heavy clay areas adjacent to the eelgrass. So they'll go, you actually can see where those two volunteers are standing in this image. Um, they seem, you know, th that's the eelgrass there. And then um, these horseshoe crabs are in uh, an area that's, that's pretty heavy mud um, and they're avoiding the, the rocks and the actual <coughs> nesting tends to go on in the muddy spots in between. Uh, and I, that is different from other horseshoe crabs in other places, as far as I know. Yeah. But um, I don't fully understand it. Yes, Anne, go ahead. It, it Dave's, Dave's Cove, we found that the area outside of zone one and outside of zone 14, which were flatter and sandier, had a lot more horseshoe crabs. And of course, we didn't count those because they weren't you know, part of our zone where we were looking. Yeah. We also found that they tended to go there earlier 
Huh. So we'd see a crab, we hadn't seen any, and it's like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on so we can count you, you know. <laughs> they're over there having their party, and we're like, come on, you know, we be able to count some. <laughs> Despite what you say about being a scientist, you certainly did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> we had such a good time, and I think even in this pandemic, it was so nice to get outside and have a focus of something to do at least three times a week. And we had to look at tide charts and we had to look at weather. And we, we uh, found as much information as we could online about the crabs to find out what on earth they were doing and what they were thinking and you know that kind of stuff. Yeah. Really, really fun. We really enjoyed it. Well, at some point we need a scientist to do a, a proper peer reviewed article about some of this work because these yeah. crabs are different, and one of the other things that I'd like to do is partner with the university, have them do some DNA um, sampling of horseshoe crabs up and down the coast, and figure out um, what the DNA tells us about the separateness or or not um, of the populations. How close are they? And that is something that we could certainly um, we can sort of do in the future. The other thing that I noticed that or we noticed sort of interesting is. Uh, especially in the beginning when we didn't have too many in each zone, you could see a variation in the color of the shell. Yep. And the way we could tell um, too, whether we counted someone, it was depending on the number of barnacles or the seaweed sticking out. <laughs> you know, we already got that one, you know. So that was also fascinating when told us that there there is a, a a large variation yeah one horseshoe crab and the other yeah great. Bill, Bill, Sarah? Question. yes great bill go ahead um two questions sarah one is you you might have addressed it i might have missed it um is there a specific time of day when the crabs would tend to mate is it in darkness or is it light driven because they have these 10 eyes that they can you know quote unquote see better yeah uh, is there a time of day when they do that um, it actually seems to be triggered by, as someone mentioned, the, the high tide. Um, they, they come up in the high tide and then they go back I, out in the lower tides. Um, and I, I wonder about the reasoning for that because to me, um, that would put their eggs at more risk perhaps. Um, yeah. Because their eggs are exposed, um, you know, more. On the other hand, um, the little tiny minnows may be their biggest predator. Because what I see is um, the little mummy chugs and the silver sides will follow these um, spawning activities and those fish will, will get right in there just as, even as little water is covering it and they'll eat as many of those eggs as they can, they can get hold of. They'll even dig them up. I've seen the fish, um, they'll rub their bellies into the, into the nest and they'll expose the eggs. So um, mm -hmm. I, I don't fully know why it's high tide, but if I had to guess, it's related to the predation of the little fish. Um, and okay. It'd be good to know that, but so I, it's a good question. Yeah. Second question I have is, um, how, how does the, the male find this female? Is it just, uh, you know, because there are so many thousands of them there or, or, or dozens of them that they just stumble upon a female? Or are there some certain pheromones that, uh, you know, some kind of horseshoe crab perfume that, that, that's exuded that draws the males in there? That's exactly right. It's horseshoe crab um, perfume that's exuded and then is washed into the water and, and is all around them. So that's how they're identifying where the females are. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. May I ask one more question, Sarah? Absolutely. Um, about the the blood that um has been used i read that the vax with the uh, pandemic virus vaccination research they were again going to be using the horseshoe crab blood and even though they've developed some synthetic blood that that hasn't been um given permission to be used in many places have you heard anything about that um, not since the initial announcement that the, when the initial announcement came out that there was a synthetic blood that, that had been um, 
created and I knew as far as I knew it hadn't wasn't in production and that that generally is because of exactly what you're talking about which is that it hasn't been approved um in all the right places yet so um that's how that what what you're telling me makes sense and I, I don't know much more about it um I I didn't know either that this is potentially something useful related to the pandemic um because a vaccine is usually a totally different arena, um, not related to this blood, but there's a lot I don't know about the medicinal components of this for sure. Well, I, I don't either, but um, what I had read or heard, I don't even know which anymore, um, was that they were using it to dis discover if there was bacteria in the, in the vaccination, that there's something in the, um, the blood of the horseshoe crabs right. identifies bacteria very easily. So yeah. that was the aspect that they were using it for, not as part of the vaccination, but to Got test. It. Yeah, it's an that makes sense. That makes sense. I think, um, yeah, because that's exactly what they do is it, because it's not hemoglobin based. It's it's um, which is iron based. It's a copper based blood, um, and so. It doesn't grow the same bacteria as what you would generally see in the hemoglobin-based blood. So, what you're telling me makes perfect sense. That they would be probably doing side-by-side -side studies where they've got hemoglobin-based blood and copper-based blood, and they're trying to look at, um, you know, what bacteria is growing in the vaccine. Um, and and because they're taking antibodies and plasma and so forth from natural sources, they probably are having to be very careful about the bacteria and what would be in there. Right. Well, I hope we'll, I hope we'll keep our critters. I hope so too. I hope <laughs> so too. Yeah. Although this I'd like to see a vaccine as well. So I guess I'm torn. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, this has been fascinating, Sarah. Well, I'm glad you all could join. If there's any other questions or if anything occurs to you after the fact, you're welcome to email me. My email is in several places on the website. Um, where you, Hannah can reach me too if you have her email, but it's esquadu at coastalrivers.org.